everybody. Welcome to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I'm Ray, if you don't know, uh, your audiobook reviewer. And today I will be reviewing some current and classic Lit RPG audiobooks for y'all. Today I'm going to begin with Bunker Core, Core Control Series Book 1 by Andrew Seipel, narrated by Mark Boyette with a book length of 9 hours and 4. Count them 4 minutes. Hell is nothing. I knew that because this was hell, and I was in it. And nothing was the extent of my senses. No sight, no sound, no feeling from my body, and no memory of how this had come to pass. No memory of anything, for that matter. No memory of me. I panicked then, tried to grab a hold of something, anything, but that was impossible without arms. I tried to shout to call for help, but I had no voice. Nothing changed, and I had no body to feel, no mouth to spit curses, just my thoughts. So I got a hold of them and tried to breathe. Nope, nothing there either. So, the first thing I want to do is be really honest with you. I always try to be honest. I try not to hold back my opinions. And I have to say, I was a little disappointed with this book. Uh, coming off the Threadbare series, which I believe that there was, you know, it was really good. And I just felt there was going to be a lot more to this tale. Uh, I, I just, I was kind of shocked. Uh, to me, the book is really, it's Threadbare. If you want to know the truth of it, it's a little short compared to the other stuff. And I was surprised at that first and foremost. And I don't know if that's because this was his first foray into kind of getting out there and touching uh, base with the Dungeon Core style stories. Or if he just wanted to keep it nice, short and sweet. And then and, and if it, it really went well, move ahead. But it was comparative to the other books that he's done. It was a little light uh, on the time, you know, listening at, you know, nine hours and so. That isn't bad. That's actually one of my preferred, you know, listening times. Anything below 10 hours is really prime for me. But I also think coming off Threadbare, there was a little bit more meat on those bones and the story was a little better for it, I think. I think there was a lot of things that was in that story. Here, this is a pretty much simple, straightforward story. Um, I just think it was thin in terms of tale uh, and characters. There wasn't a lot going on here. And again, it's not a bad book, but that's my first takeaway was that there should have been more to it as far as I was concerned. Uh, the book is about what I'm going to call a, a tech core that was once human, or at least the memories of it or the personality of it belong to a human, that wakes up after an alert takes place and it finds that the facility it's in is under attack. And it does the best that it can to fend off the assault while figuring out, you know, simultaneously who it is or was and what the hell it's supposed to do. Uh, and from this point, it basically continues on in the same manner. Someone from the first seizures, seizures, the first siege people, the first people who attack them, uh, come and they have to be fought off. Um, and, and this kind of is a, is a rinse, wash, repeat sort of cycle, or is it wash, rinse, repeat? I don't, maybe I do it backwards because I, I wet my hair and then let it set and I wash and then I, I, I well, anyway, um, you get my point. It just kind of goes on and on in the same kind of fashion. There's never any deviation from that first model. It's just really a question of what is the dungeon or the facility, whatever you want to call it, going to do. Uh, and, and that's it. Um, and the only variation we ever see comes when there's a PO, POV shift, a point of view shift from the leader of the tribe that is assaulting the core or one of the other several AIs that seem to have it out for our beloved core, the one that we're rooting for. Now, I don't know if any of my issues come from the fact that this feels a lot like a station core novel. It very well could be. Or if there was really nothing really innovative about what the core did when it confronted its invaders. There was a lot of setup for different things that never really bore out for me. I was half hoping that the core would have built a lab and modified some of the bats that lived in its elevator, making some sweet soldiers to harass the enemy. Never happened. You know, any other dungeon core book or something like that would have done something with the monsters that lived there or used them 
in a more effective way than what was done here. Uh, I also, I needed more than fire, floor, and ceiling traps and bolt guns to see the dungeon cores being exciting. Now, everything worked, and it was plausible, and it, it was an interesting story. But it was not amazing. It was nothing new. I hadn't seen or heard before uh, when it comes to dungeons. I mean, especially if, if you think about like the, the standard dungeon core stuff, they always have traps and floor traps and ceiling traps and, and all that stuff. Those are just kind of run-of-the-mill kind of things. And, and that's why I was kind of, yeah, it, it, they should have done more with the nanites because the nanites played a really big role in the story. And for some reason... They weren't able to be used for attack purposes, not in major ways. Little tiny, teeny ways, and I realize you have to restrict, but I think that the nanites could have been used in innovative ways that have been a lot more interesting than, you know, uh, making people fall into a pit trap repeatedly. Just me. Um, you know, so those things I'm talking about, like the, the pit traps and the ceiling collapsing, those are all great for initial forays into the palace but not for an end battle scenario and i don't count the outside stuff that happens with the crocodile monster or the the water that floods everybody as being all that innovative either i mean there was just some things that you know he did outside uh that i was like well yeah i get that but it didn't hit me as hard as it could have i think there was a lot of missed opportunity with the story uh, that we, we we should have had more. Um, the story had a ton of potential, and I mean that seriously. Um, but whenever one of the other eyes came on, the AIs came on, I don't know if I said that properly, whenever one of the other artificial intelligence came on, I wanted to just skip that part and get back to the core. The core is an interesting character. It was an interesting place. Um, the others did not maintain my interest at all. And I even think... That it goes to the same for the ball-headed leader, uh, the female boss of the Raiders, um, because there. Well, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. I think the fact that there were three or four artificial intelligences beside the core made it a little bit less fun. I'm even counting the one that was there to help him. Now, I get that this was partially all setup stuff, um, but you know, honestly, uh, there are just things that you have to do that you know, get you to a place you need to be. But I don't know. Um, just pick a villain and stick with it is the way I look at it. Because the, the the first villain that pops up is the one that put him in the place he's at. It's, it's a kind of ambiguous bad guy because we don't really get to see her, the artificial intelligence. Um, then there's another artificial intelligence and then a third artificial intelligence um, and then there's the Raid Queen, or whatever you want to call her. Um, there were too many bouncing around, and none of them really took precedence, uh, even at the end of the book. It, it was just kind of like, I, I didn't know who to say, this is really the main bad guy. And, and that's just the way it was. I just think that, you know, pick one and stick with it, and build those other ones in later on. Um, another issue I had was that the bald-headed warrior leader of the cult that was attacking the core started out as a real hardcore crush monster kind of chick. But at the end of the story, she kind of got shifted into being very humanized, very much humanized. You actually could see her motivations and you could actually feel some sympathy for her. Uh, and that just to me, it didn't work. I mean, uh, you, you spend all this time seeing her as this hardcore, you know, go out and cr crunch people under your heel kind of, I don't know. I don't want to say this without being sexist or anything. Um, but this this lady who goes out and stomps people into the ground uh, ruthlessly, very much ruthlessly, starts to become less so because you get to see why she does what she does. Uh, and you really just needed to hate her, not like her or sympathize with her. And in some ways, you do. Uh, and and she needed to be. A one-dimensional, not multifaceted character, uh, because the the multifaceted stuff did not work. She was great up until a point, and after that, it kind of flipped around, and you start saying, "Well, I can kind of see why she's doing what she's doing. She's got mouths to feed, and she's got too many people. When people are going to starve, and they're going to die, and she's got to make sacrifices. So they've got to take this place out because she's been told to take this place out. And if she loses people." 
great because that's one less mouse he has to feed. There's a lot of stuff like that through the whole thing that you, you kind of say, I needed somebody to just go kill him, kill him, beat the crap out of her. She's horrible. And, and, and I think that the, the one thing that happens is there's, there's a point where the core says, look, don't do this. If you do, bad things are going to happen. And she says she knows it. She believes it. And yet, I, you know, I can't go into it, but you understand what, what do you think is going to be? Um, I just wish that the, the end of the story wasn't quite so weak because it doesn't end on a cliffhanger. But a lot of what was worked for and towards in the whole thing is just kind of made moot by the ending uh, because there's almost a full reset button pushed on the end of the story. Uh, and that said, the story, while short, it does flow, and it is well written. Sciple knows how to tell a story and make it interesting. Like I say, um, I enjoyed the book. I, I wanted to get back to the core as things went on. I hated leaving the core because I didn't care about the other, other AIs. I didn't feel like they were necessary to the tale. They could have been added in a little bit at a time in another story or in a bigger story. I mean, this story is small. You, you, you crunch in all this stuff in a small tale. If you took out two of those AIs, the, the story has a lot less going on uh, noise-wise, and it would have been fine. Um, it would have probably improved the book a little bit. Or if you em, embiggen, is that the new thing that they say now, is that you embiggen? Uh, if you embiggen the story... Um, then having them come in and, and fleshing them out more would have been great. But there were characters that I just didn't see what they were doing there, like these, these, um, I don't know, I'll call them like, uh, Animen, which were creatures that were created specifically out of old parts of other things. Um, and just where they roll into this, I'm not sure. They're, they're going to be bigger in the future, I think. But there were things that just didn't pan out. <laughs> But it was still a good story. It was still good. It, it rolled along nicely. The fights were good. They were interesting. But again, it just it just didn't click quite as well as it should have for me. The narration here is really good. And I actually recognize Mark, believe it or not, the narrator, from a Doc Samson novel that I listened to way back when, you know, as well as a 30 Days of Night uh, audio adaptation of the comic books. He does a fantastic job here. And I think that Lit and he are a good fit for one another. And he has a pretty big background in sci-fi, so Lit RPG isn't that big of a stretch for him. Great voices, pacing, and storytelling in general. But as much as he did, he could not um, give the story that much more life than it needed to you know, make me say, man, that was a damn good book. I really want the next one. I honestly, I'll probably get the next book when it comes out, um, but I'm not hankering for it. I'm really not on the edge of my seat with my, my nails dug into the wood saying, where's my story? Where's my story? Like Dark Elf with Dave Wilmorth or War Returns with Charles Dean or VGO with James Hunter or Divine Dungeon with Dakota Crowd. Those, you know, Blaze Corvin's um, Delvers. Those, those books keep me on the hook. On the hook. This one, you know, even the first Threadbearer, I was like waiting for the next Threadbearer to come out. This one didn't do it to me. I'll be like, okay, I'll pick it up and, and see where it goes. It's worth the time. It's worth the time. So, I'm, you know, my final score is going to be a seven stars. Uh, the, the story really felt truncated. It didn't have a centralized villain that it totally needed. And it seemed to hover at the same point for a long time. I needed someone to root against and a lot more time spent upgrading the dungeon rather than figuring out where to put the next pitfall trap. Lots of potential, not enough return, so seven stars. Sorry, Andrew, I really do think you're an amazing writer, um, and this is a very powerfully potential storyline, but it needs fleshed out a hell of a lot more, I think, in my opinion, uh, to keep me coming back after the next book. So seven stars. So next up is Reborn Apprentice, a lit RPG adventure. Reclamation, book one, by Luca Petrov, narrated by... Rafe Beckley, with a length of four hours and ten minutes. We passed through the barrier with ease since we were already keyed into the frequency of Dreyrath, and we entered the lush, enchanted forest. I found the trail that Harmon and I took to arrive at Dreyrath, and it appeared we were on our way to safety. 
As I showed my friends through the enchanted forest, a suspicious feeling came over me, the feeling of being watched. The hairs on the back of my neck rose and goosebumps covered my forearms. From behind me, the sound of a branch broke and my stomach dropped. We had landed right into the palms of Abraxas's minions. A squad of Mayroliths surrounded us. These Mayroliths were disgusting. They had the lower body of a snake and the upper body of a humanoid woman with six arms. Their eyes glowed blue and they had pointed ears. They traveled from the abyss. I, I, I hated this book. I, I hated this book. Ye gods, where do I start to tell you what is wrong with this book? Seriously. I, I, I have very rarely, like, I can only think of one other book that I hated listening to as much as I did this. And it was the sexy, uh, whatever it was book by JJ Janess. And the writing and, and the narration there really, really turned me off. I hated this book so much more for so many different reasons uh, that I, I don't even know how to start. So this was probably, I'm just going to put it like this, this was probably the longest four hours of my life. I've had teeth pulled. I've had kidney stones that have given me pain. I have broken my clavicle. I would gladly, gladly substitute any of those times four hours of those moments in my life for not reading this book. I would do it in a heartbeat. Magic Genie appear, and I would take that deal. Pow! In a heartbeat. I will suffer the broken clavicle. I will suffer the most horrible kidney stones I've ever had. I would suffer the pulmonary embolism that I had that felt like I was getting stabbed in the chest every time I inhaled before I would reread this book. And if I could do that, with having this book removed from my life and my mind forever, I would do that too. Um, it just offended me on multiple levels, often simultaneously. And it made me feel like the author wanted to treat me like a child rather than a rational adult. Because most of this book made this much sense. And for those of you who are listening and can't see it, I'm making a big zero, a capital O with my hand. Because first of all, and this is where I'm going to start um, this is not a lit RPG book. I don't know if you guys have seen it, read it, heard about it, or, or what. I, I don't know. But it's not. It's not even game lit. I don't know what the hell this is supposed to be other than bad. Because I can usually, and I will, will forgive a book for having lighter lit RPG elements to it. I don't feel like every story needs to have stats or character sheets or leveling up and so on and so forth in vast quantities to qualify as lit RPG. I know Ramon is a lot tougher on that sort of stuff than I am. Um, I take it f for what it's worth. I, I say that, that they're set in the game world and, and I understand that. And that's pretty much all I need in order to get through a book and, and believe it's lit RPG. This, this, where in the hell did they come up with the idea that this was lit RPG? Where did the writer even have the cojones to say this was a lit RPG book? Like I said, I usually am very forgiving on stuff like this. Not here. Not here. Four hours of my life got drained away, and I I, I did it because I was listening to a lit RPG book, but not... But not, like I said, if it was a lit RPG book, I could actually forgive a lot of this. No, I really couldn't because the story is awful. But I could at least say at least it's a lit RPG book and you guys could give it a try. Maybe it's more of your flavor. It's not for me. Here, there is no way. There is nothing. I mean, the things that you might say qualify as lit RPG, let me run them down. Okay? Let me run them down. I do need more than five or six sentences to qualify as something being lit RPG. And this has nothing in the way of lit RPG. It has two scenes. Two. Deuce. Deuce. And I'm going to say deuce because that's what this smells like. It's deuce. It is two scenes in which stat sheets are substituted by vocational cards. In other words, if you're a blacksmith, you get a magical card that says, I'm a blacksmith, and here are the things that I can do. I can lift a hammer. I can pound metal. I can blow a forge. 
And I believe me, the writer of this thing can blow my forge because I did not like this book. The vocational cards were stupid and they did not come into play in any way, shape, or form that even comes close to being a character sheet. None. In fact, they don't really do anything other than just kind of mention a few parts to it. There's also a little bit of discussion about attributes. I mean, there's one bit where the MC is able to suss out how to cast spells because of all his previous knowledge as a gamer in a previous life. But that's it. Uh, the attribute stuff, he, like, burned out a crystal that was testing to see, like, what his, his abilities were, like, strength and constitution, and his intelligence was so high, it blew out the crystal. That's it. Beyond those three things, there is nothing. And I mean literally nothing. Everything else is just a story about this guy who gets killed, gets drained. It. Well, I'll, I'll go into it. Okay, look, look. I have literally, I'll, I'll go into the other stuff in a minute. I have literally stubbed my toe. Stubbed my toe and received health point or hit point loss notifications in my own real life more than this book provided me. Okay, I don't know how to say it. I have even seen minus one HP come up when I stub my toe. And I'm not even in a video game. I'm not. If I were, I would go to this world and kill the guy. And I'll tell you why, okay? So here's a brief rundown for you so I can elaborate why I want this main character to die, okay? A kid in our world, right here, this place, where we live now, is hit by a car. He dies. He is given the choice to reincarnate. He can reincarnate, he can go to heaven, or he can go smash it in the RPG-style world that was made perfectly for him. But it will also place his very existence in jeopardy. He is made to be the one and only person in all of existence on the whole planet Earth and all of heaven. The only one that can stop a demonic overlord known as Abraxas. And I mean... The only one. There can be only one, as the Highlanders say. There can be only one. Well, in this case, there is only one. And if we kill him, it will destroy this whole world. Because if the demon lord of Braxis is not stopped, they're just going to scrap the whole universe. And everybody who lived in it, they're just going to be gone poof like they never existed. Like a fart in the wind. And that's what we need to do. We need to get hold of this MC somehow and gank him and just let this world go by the wayside. Okay, all I can tell you is, other than picking the proper choice, which if you were given a choice, why would you pick a lit RP, not even a lit RP, why would you pick an RPG game world where your soul would be in jeopardy over heaven, over heaven, because heaven's going to be boring? I really don't think so. Heaven is heaven. Heaven is heaven. There's a reason why it's called heaven. Because anything you want is going to be in heaven. You want to play an RPG? Poof, you have got it in heaven. Why do this? I don't know. It's really stupid. But then again, the whole book is stupid. The character is stupid. The premise is stupid. What? What? This came on a short bus, and I hate to sound like that, but this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard read or seen. I mean, it just, it does not make sense. This is a Harry Potter ripoff in so many ways. Okay, this is where we enter the Harry Potter phase. So let me just go into that then, okay? The MC goes to a school of magic and begins to learn from his wonderful mentor and several teachers whom he continuously astounds with his 25-point intelligence and eidetic memory, his photographic memory. Now, I'm going to say two things about this section of the book. One, it is like a lesser version of Hogwarts, where he meets his friends and they, they chat at mealtimes. And his best friend is the second smartest, because Hermione might be the smartest one in Harry Potter's world. But in this world, the MC, and I don't even remember his name, that's how bad it is. The MC is the smartest. So his best friend has to be the second smartest in his class. So... There's Hermione, this woman, this chick, this girl, Hermione girl there. And his other friend is this half-wit and half-wit incompetent that is really a horrible wizard. Hmm. Ron Weasley? And let me just say this real quick. <laughs> I hate this book for making me even consider, consider discussing Harry Potter. Because I hate those books. I hate them. 
I hate the movies. I hate the books. And the fact that I've had to read those books to my kids because they wanted to have them read to them when they were kids. And I had to live those freaking books night after night after night after night. It just galls me. And the fact that I had to come back to this and see it happen all over again just irritates me. Now, they say, this is another point, and this is just horrible, horrible writing. They say the full name of every single teacher and most of the kids, 90% of the time, every time they're mentioned. So if, let's just say um, you, you, you have uh, Professor Lockhart. You would say Professor Gilderoy Lockhart over and over again, okay? Professor Albus, blah, 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 blah Dumbledore, whatever all of his names are. I, I don't even want to pretend like I know that. I'm not even going to try because if I do it and I, I get it right, it's going to just pee me off even more. Anyway, they repeat those names ad nauseum to a point I have to wonder if this was done just to fulfill some word count for a freaking four-hour book. I mean, honestly, if you're that strapped to put some words into a novel, just put out a three three hour book because having the names repeated over and over and over and over and over and over again is maddening. It's maddening. I don't even know how you could read it because it would drive me insane just reading it. Okay. Having to hear someone say those names over and again, it was like having, okay, I'm a parent. God help me. I have five kids in my life. Now, one is old enough that she lives away, but I have four children that live at home now. And it's like having one of my kids saying, mom, 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 to infinity and beyond, to infinity and beyond. That's what it's like. It drove me insane. I honestly, I don't know. I just, I now lament a runtime so short. Because when I, I used to say, oh, man, I can get this book and read this book and, and, and listen to it in three hours. And this will be like a good book to go on the pod, podcast and say, oh, hey, you know, I really like short stories. This is a good one. There's a short story here. And I can tell you about this. Four hours felt like 400 freaking years with this. OK, as in like here, here's a good point. I could say, gee whiz. The Luxstat strategy, Secret of the Old Ones, was only five hours long. I kept, I just, I just, I wish there was more of it. And in this case, I kept thinking, holy Mary, mother of God, this book is never going to end, and it's only four hours long. Repetition like that is annoying. It is similar to a lit RPG when you have the words, you have taken five points of damage repeated 30 times in a row. I don't like that in a little RPG, and I don't like it anywhere else. You know, it just, you've taken five points of damage. You've taken five points of damage. You've taken five points of damage. Ad nauseum, ad nauseum. I don't like it. Most writers now try to avoid repeating the same or similar words in a paragraph just to avoid monotony. Such avoidance isn't easy. Sometimes trying to avoid things can cause you stress, which will make you want to avoid it even more. Do you get the point? How many times did I say the word avoid or avoided or avoiding? Just in that one little sentence, it was just really weird hearing it. Uh, and, and they do that in the book throughout. Not just names, but just things like that. Get the point, get the point, get the point. Now, imagine that with eight different people's names in a constant, never-ending barrage of machine gun fire. And, and, and it just, it, okay? Now, I think the biggest letdown of the book came. Believe it or not, there was even a bigger disappointment. Yes, a larger, more horrific disappointment came with the confrontation with the evil overlord Voldemort. I mean, Abraxas. Dumbledore sacrifices his life so that Harry and the others can get away. Yes, I'm going to spoil some things, okay? I mean, the MC and his pals, okay? Abraxas is completely overblown throughout the entire story. Oh, he is the most powerful mage, wizard, sorcerer, whatever the hell he is in this whole world. And then he... Uh, do I spoil it? Do I tell you what he does? No. But let's just say this. He, he is very childish in his manner. Uh, and what he does makes absolutely no sense at all. None. I mean, literally, if this is the worst they've got to worry about, 
there's no reason why like three wizards from the school shouldn't be able to kill this cat because he has no foresight. He has no sense of planning and he has no, no real ability because he literally fights the student that's supposed to be there to kill him. He has no clue. He, and, and, and he doesn't destroy him like you would think. Okay. I mean, they get into a thing and they're out there fighting with sticks. Okay. Fighting with friggin' sticks. Yes. Yes. He is so overblown. He's supposed to be this big, horrible monster like Darth Vader on crack. And it comes across like a stormtrooper with one eye and a gun that has a trigger that sticks. Just does not fly well with me. Okay. It seriously soured me from straight fantasy. For some time to come, because that's all this is. This is a straight fantasy novel, and I don't even want to read fantasy anymore. I mean, this book just said, Bleh, "I'm done with it. I can't do this anymore." Now, the, the, here's here's the thing. Okay, the book feels like it has been written by someone who had no frigging idea what Little RPG is and simply wanted to do a right to market effort in order to cash in on some of that sweet Little RPG action. I hated this book the longer I listened to it, and I'm repulsed at the minimum amount of effort that was put into making this a Lit RPG book. The only thing saying it's Lit is the cover. Take that away, and you have a crappy kid's book that pretty much covers the fact that it's riffing on J.K. Howling by pretending it's Lit RPG, and it doesn't even do that very damn well. I cannot believe I'm even defending the Freaking Harry Potter novels. Okay, that's how mad this book made me. Now, before I go, before I go, I suppose I'll have to mention one thing about the narration. To be blunt, it sucked. Okay, the narrator could not figure out a way to differentiate the male MC's voice from his female companion's voice. There were times I could not tell who was speaking, the MC or one of the female students. The other voices, with the exception of the boy's mentor, come across like a grandpa telling his grandson a bedtime story, trying to do voices and keep pacing and emotions. Now, I'm not talking about like the Princess Bride-style grandfather. That would have been cool. I'm talking about a grandpa with COPD suffering from bipolar disorder. And he was clear, he was understandable, told an intelligent story, but it wasn't fun. It wasn't fun. There were parts where the characters espouse some sort of exclamation. And instead of, wow, we got a wow. Like, literally, he was like, you have just broken through to the highest level of spell casting you could ever get. And the guy says, wow, that's great. Like that. Like that. It's not, wow, that's great. I'm on a narrator. And I can say, I could read how that was supposed to be said off an invisible script because I can't see the words, but I can still say, see how they're supposed to be said. The narration did not help this story. Upon reflection, it didn't hurt it, since this seemed to be at the same level as the writing, which was crap, crap, and crap. Okay, sorry, the book has my dander up. It really has. I have really not felt this way about a book in a long time, and I don't know if it's just the combination of everything. It's like a perfect storm of horrible. It, 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 it's like, just, I just want to sh shove this in a toilet and flush it, and, and the problem is it would probably get stuck, and I'd have to plunge it or get a snake to root it out because it's just that big a piece of crap, okay? It, it's it's not even like a good portal fantasy story. I'm not a fan. Okay, final score. Really? 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 You have to ask? Well, the book did have a cohesive plot line, and it had characters who spoke and interacted, so it gets two points for that. Now, I want you to understand, if this was a right-to-market that was so good... I would absolutely say this this might be a break the market, but this was a great book. I don't care who they are or what they did before they got here. This was a fantastic story. So don't feel that I'm peeved because this was a break the market book. I'm peeved because this was a right to market book by somebody who had no clue what Lit RPG is, and it stinks. It's horrible. It is such trash that they have the gall to even consider putting this out there and expecting you and I to listen or read this story. It is abominable. It is an abomination to God's eyes and ears. Okay, so I give the book two stars stars because it did tell a story and the characters charact charactered, charactered throughout the story. Two, and I think that is too high, but I can't say it didn't have a cohesive story and it didn't have characters that talked and did things because... It, if it didn't make sense, I would have said so, and it would have only had one star. 
This is a piece of garbage. Roll this up and throw it away as fast as you can. Don't flush it because it'll get stuck. I wouldn't even let my kids listen to this as a way to start them into portal fantasy or fantasy or any other genre for that matter. That's how much I hate this book. And this book actually feels like a young adult style book because it is definitely not written for intelligent adults. And I'm not saying that teenagers are idiots, but it is written to a level that is below me so far that I, I just, I'm offended that they even put this on the screen for me to choose from just just because that's how dumb this story is it's it's horrible now if if you have read this book or you've listened to this book and you liked it god bless you and i'm sorry that i've been so harsh to this book but this book has just taken me into a tailspin of outright rage and anger i mean i kept listening to it and i almost did it the entire way through in one shot I only stopped because I had to. I had to. And I, I did not want to return. I kept saying, I've only got 45 minutes left. I could do 45 minutes. And I really couldn't. I couldn't. But I did anyway. I went back for you guys. Just so I could say, I listened to this whole damn book and did not quit. Because I will not give you a partial review. Won't do it. This book just, ooh, it got me in the in the gods okay so this is my my gift to you i'm warning you now stay away stay very far away and if whoever it is that wrote this book uh, and luca petrov is that who did this i have to go back and look luca petrov i don't know who luca is but this is a horrible horrible book and and i don't do this very often i really don't usually i try to find the best parts of a story or, you know, if, if, a, if a story's bad, I'll say, here's, here's the top things I liked about this book. And if a story's really good, but it has flaws, I'll say, here's the flaws of the book. Here's the flaws, but the book is really good. Give this book a try. I'm just saying, here's what I think is wrong with it. This book is really horrible and there's nothing good about it. Nada. The character's overpowered. The characters are boring. The story is, is just a riff on another mystical magical school i don't want to talk about it anymore um, there is no little rpg and again if this is not a right to market book i apologize but i swear to you this is what it feels like and again if it were a right to market book that was good i would tell you i would say hey it might be right to market but fantastic it is a fantastic book this i cannot do again it's just my guess but stay away two stars, and that's probably the lowest I'll ever go to. The next book I'm going to review is Limitless Lands, The Commander's Tale, a lit RPG adventure by Dean Hanegar, narrated by Jack Varazes, with a book length of 8 hours and 39 minutes. After working his horde up to a frenzy, the adept pointed toward our line and the mass of wretched goblins charged. The adept and the warriors fell in well behind the wretched goblins, content to use them as a meat shield as they overran our position. Sergeant Brooks, bring third squad in line on the right flank. We will extend our formation, but be ready to refuse the flank if the goblins try to get around us. I ordered. I would have preferred holding some forces in reserve, but with that many goblins, I needed as long a front as possible. I positioned myself in line between first and second squad, that way, all of our soldiers should be covered by the commanding presence aura from either myself or Sergeant Brooks. Brooks took the dangerous spot on the far right of our line. Prepare javelins. Release on my mark. Okay, so here's an example of what is a good book but has mediocre kind of narration. I don't know how to say it another way. Uh, Limitless Lands doesn't blow you away with new concepts or avoidance of tropes. Um, this is a pretty standard novel insofar as it centers on James Raytack, uh, the MC, who was a vet who was coming towards the end of his days. Um, and this is all set in a future world where soldiers such as James are no longer needed. The, the, the warfare has kind of shifted over to um, drones and robots and that sort of thing, and people just kind of do their little thing with a little stick. It's kind of like gaming, but with guns that go out and blow up robots. Um, anyway, fortunately for him, um, his son is employed in one of the best VR gaming companies in the biz. 
and he sets his old man up with a special dive tank that provides both life support and medical care, in addition to being a virtual reality kind of immersion portal. So yeah, he sets his pappy up to be like this test subject, uh, like all loving and care- caring kids should. But now I know that I said this doesn't really break the standard tropes, but in in this one case, in, in this one case, I'm going to say um, they do because the company that the kid works for actually has a heart. So far in the first book, they actually seem to care about the man's condition. They really want to help him. Like their their whole point to doing this is to rebuild his mind and rebuild his body so that he's not like some feeble minded, memory lost old guy. Uh, he'll come out of it healthier and, and better than when he went in. Um, so they're kind of Steve Rogering him through nanites. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, it shows that it cares about its employees and their families as opposed to the standard, there are hidden and shadowy motives behind their help kind of stuff that we usually see in an RPG. So that was kind of refreshing. I will give it that. What I sort of found to be interesting was this is basically just the company shoving some old dude who is 90 plus years old into an RPG for some weird version of rehab. <laughs> okay. I mean, if you want to look at it, that's what they're doing. Okay. Like the tank is going to fix up his mind and his body. But either way, they shove his butt right into a coma. Okay. So the plan is to fix his failing memory and his old man bod while he's comified. Now, this is where the fun begins. The book is really primarily a battle-oriented tale. So if you are into military sci-fi or just very authentic-feeling ancient warfare, well, I can't say very authentic-feeling, but anyway, this is the book for you because this is exactly what you get. Loads of it, too. Loads of action, lots of battlefield scenes um, with some other gaming stuff on the side. One aspect I found pretty interesting is that the MC only gained XP for like the full scale battles, you know, if he was on the field and he killed somebody, that didn't register um, on his his chart for getting anything. But by the time the battle was over, bam, that's when he got all his his experience. So you know, it wasn't one on one encounters; it was the whole thing, the whole battlefield, the whole warfare that kind of did things for him. And that's it. So in order to advance, he's got to be on the battlefield. And I have to say, this feels very genuine in the ways that the battle battles were run and described. So if you are, you know, more of a one-on-one sword fighting kind of person, the book might not be for you. Um, military books are not for everybody. Um, this is a fantasy world, so it does have, like, lots of monsters and humanoids uh, in the battles and that sort of thing. So it's not just like, you know, because it is a Roman uh, soldier kind of uh, startup place. It's not just men versus men wearing armor and, and so on and so forth. There is more to it than that. All right. Um, just so you know, I think the biggest flaw in the book is that the, the character is OP, but it's not the OPness of the MC. He kind of starts out with, um, in the story, with a very specialized class that allows him to command different troops and so on. And it comes across as being handed to him. Now, I've thought about it. And the whole point of the story was to rebuild his brain, okay? And to do so, he pretty much needed to be in a place of comfort that so for that to happen. It had to be like a natural environment for him. And if he had to start off as, say, a private, I don't think that would have been as good a fit for him. It wouldn't feel as quite as natural and as comfortable. He had been in command for such a long time and was used to being in charge. And to throw him into the, the body of a private, you know, or a, a freshly minted soldier, uh, it just would not have felt the same for him, and he would not have gotten a lot of the growth to fix his brain that he, he needed. Um, he needed to have to start from a position of power and authority for it to be a natural fit. So I think that, you know, that that's one reason why Dan Hennigar does that with the story. Now, I don't know. I haven't talked to Dan Hennigar. I don't know him, uh, but I'm hoping that's the case because otherwise he just made a really OP character for no reason other than to he just wanted to have things happen in the story. Um, and rather than building the character up as most books do, you know, most books, you, you get a character and they say, okay, here's where you go. Uh, you're going to start out at first level and you're going to earn rank. And then, you know, maybe by third level, you're going to become a, a corporal. And by fifth level, you'll be a captain. And by sixth level, you'll be the, and, and so on and so forth like that. But you don't, you don't get that here. Also, the, the, the show don't tell rule applies here as a fail because there were times that the squads would do maneuvers 
uh, and things like that where the reader would be told that they drilled and practiced and drilled until they had the things down pat, but they were never shown that happening. And that was a, that was a big drawback for me. Um, I would have liked to have seen them doing, like, even if they just did like two or three times, they just did that throughout the book. Um, it would have made it believable and it would have made it unnecessary to do it like with every single thing. But if you see them trying something and then screwing it up until they got it right once or twice, it would have been perfect. So that was just a, a, a bad way of doing things. I think the story still was good, but they could have added that stuff in. You know, it wouldn't have made the book that much longer. The book is not overly long as it is. I think you still could have added about a half an hour's worth of reading time or runtime to the book and had that in there, and it would have been a much better kind of story. The real issue with this book is the narration. <sighs> this was all over the place. It, it, it was, it was. In fact, one of those books, I just wanted to go out and buy the book and read the book instead of listening to it. Because I think, I think that I would have enjoyed the book far more if I used the voices in my head and not the ones that tell me how to hurt people and, and do things, but the ones that I, I get when I read a story, those voices. Because the other voices, I try to avoid them. I have medicine for that. Anyway, um, you know, I would have rather had the voices in my head doing their job and telling me the story than listening to somebody else who got paid to do it. Uh, there are audio issues throughout the story, and it's really distracting. In today's age, there's no reason that there's not a nice, clean sound coming forth in an audiobook. This was like listening to a book on a vinyl record in spots. Secondly, I found the narrator himself both very dry and very boring. His feminine voices, if you want to call them that, were his biggest weaknesses. But he also seemed to struggle to differentiate even the male voices. Uh, it, it just seemed like he, he would have rather just read the story in a very simplistic, easygoing manner without having to apply any kind of emphasis on voices. You know, he didn't, he really didn't want to attempt. That's just how I feel. He did not want to attempt to do voices. And so he kind of half assed it through the, you know, this is, here, here's the thing. I apologize. I've really been swearing through this show a lot. And it's because of the Reborn Apprentice. Like, it, it got me so worked up. So I apologize if I'm being a little crude right now. Um, but he, I do think that the, the narrator half-assed his way through the story. Um, he did not want to give any kind of an effort whatsoever into making this interesting. It was the, the tone and the pacing. Uh, there were points I had a hard time following who was talking, and I hate it when I am forced to suss out who is doing what because of narration issues. I should never have to guess who is speaking. Never. Uh, the sound effects were utterly annoying and very distracting. I generally like SFX when done right, such as by Sound Booth Theater, but here it is heavy-handed and improperly used. My final score, I'm going to say 6.8. I would have gotten a lot more out of this if not for the narration. Uh, it would have been a lot higher, too. Uh, the fact that there is no ending, it's not a cliffhanger, but none of those themes, goals, or concerns, the story have been addressed at all by the end of the book. Uh, you know, that, that kind of kicked in for me. And as a fan of military writing, I do think that th there were some fun battles where I would have liked to have seen some research done on how the legions really fought. I don't think that he was exactly 100% accurate and just, you know, I I'm not a, I'm not a smart man, but I know when you are in battle uh, that there are, are swords clanging and people screaming and Jenny running away. Uh, those sorts of things that if I yell something, maybe about one out of every 200 of my people are going to hear it. Okay. And for him to just be able to yell and shout throughout the entire thing and have everybody know what he wants done, just it didn't, it didn't feel real and accurate to me at all. Banners and flags. I mean, you know, this is where he would go, raise the flags for the archers and the archers would all okay we got a fire now or send in the cavalry and they'd raise a banner and the cavalry would do this or he'd raise a banner and they would pull back or whatever it would be those were tactics that they did because they didn't have loudspeakers they didn't have radios they didn't have telephones um so you had to do stuff that was visual shouting on a battlefield in the midst of the din of battle itself doesn't really work all that well like i said i'm not a smart guy but i know when the bullets fly my screaming, 
That ain't going to go so well. It ain't going to go so well. Even with swords going clang, 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 and people going, ah, I got stabbed. That stuff makes it hard for me to give my people orders and have them um, react in a swift enough and efficient time to do things. So I think he could have done a little bit more better with the research. But again, I enjoyed the book. I think the military stuff was fun. I, I like that sort of thing. It's not for everybody. Uh, you know, I've probably said that twice already uh, in, in this this review stuff today. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that you would probably enjoy it if you didn't listen to it. Um, and that's just the way I look at it. The, the book is probably better as a book rather than an audio book. Because I did not, I mean, I don't know how to put it in any other words, but the fact is, Jack Verace's just did not do it for me. Um, it was just a very, very bland, unbelievable, low-key effort to get a story across. I just did not like the story because of his narration. And the funny thing is, and, I'm, I, and, and this has no bearing on anything, um, because in the game, it doesn't make a difference. But, like, they're in Kentucky or, or somewhere, like, near me. Um, either Kentucky or Tennessee. And I can't remember where it was. Uh, but, like, they don't even try to do, like, those accents at all. And and, and the guy that's reading it, Verazes, uh, he, he's got a British accent throughout the entire thing. There's no attempt to even, you know, y'all, you know, none of that kind of draw or, I mean, nothing. There's just no attempt. It was just really weird. Um, like I said, you know, what's Ron Swanson say? Don't half-ass, you know, one thing, whole-ass one thing. Or don't half-ass two things, whole-ass one thing. Um, Ron Swanson has a really good point. Um, I think Hennigar really just, just half-heartedly gave an effort here. Um, I don't think he had any kind of love for this material whatsoever. I didn't see it, and, and I'm going to stop there because last time I made a comment about this kind of stuff, I got in a little bit of trouble. But this guy just did not seem to be into the story in the way that he should have been. I mean, you know, fake it till you make it, brother. Even if you hate it, pretend that you love it because this is your job. Everybody has a job they don't like, and if this ain't your, your cup of tea, then either pass it up or put it down like you owned it when you go to town to put this to the airwaves and like i say there were audio pops and, and brambles and it, it just everything about it audibly just was a fail um i mean if i had to give the audible stuff a score unto itself i would give it a four i would give it a four because i just did not enjoy him telling me the story i would probably have loved this book if i had a chance to read it so like i say i'm taking it into account how much I enjoyed the story as opposed to how much I hated the narration. 6.8 stars. I probably should be really fair about it and say 6.3. Okay, so the final book for the day is Super Mage Rise to Omniscience by Aaron Oster, narrated by Doug Tisdell Jr. with a book length of 8 hours and 42 minutes. Morgan arose to sunlight streaming in through the many cracks of the dilapidated shed he called home. He blinked a few times, shielding his eyes from the bothersome rays and groaning in protest. Why did the sun have to be so bright? Couldn't it let him sleep in for just a few more minutes? Finally, admitting defeat, he threw off the threadbare blanket and rolled off of the lumpy pile of rags he used as a bed. He shivered as his bare feet touched the stone floor. Quickly, he made his way to the other side of the small room where a basin of cold water lay. Stealing himself, he plunged his entire head into the basin, clearing any lingering sleep from his mind. He quickly dried his hair, then he slipped a tattered shirt over his head and slid his feet into a pair of shoes that had definitely seen better days. He then moved to stand in front of the cracked mirror, rubbing his slightly bloodshot eyes as he examined his features. So this book is kind of a conundrum for me, as there were things that I really liked and things that I didn't so much. And things that I had no idea why they happened. Um, for the most part, I would say the book is nice, light, fair. Uh, feeling very much like a young adult kind of tale because it traipses around subjects that an adult book would have no problem tackling. And I don't know if this is a YA book or not, but it surely feels like one. And the funny thing is, is like when I read the description on Amazon um, for the book, the book, because I, I went to Amazon and was looking at the, 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 the ebook stuff. Um, 
for it. Uh, I I, I kind of saw that it was like there's a warning there, like you know there's graphic violence and there's bloody this and that, and um, I kept thinking, well, it wasn't all that graphic and it wasn't all this, or, so I didn't see the need for a warning, you know, for violence or, or language or that sort of stuff, um, as opposed to you know the, the subjects so much as that they they kind of skip because there were points where they could have really kind of gone into. Um, graphic dis- discussions and they didn't do it and it was the sexual side of things um like there's there's people that are, are almost raped or there there are discussions about people who have been raped um so on and so forth it's very dark in some aspects but because of the avoidance of it it really isn't all i don't want to say it's not dramatic but it's not like it should be if it was another book so the upside of the book i'll just go into this first um the magic sim- system is pretty well fleshed out it's easy to understand, and it's fun to experience. On the other hand, and this is going to be me being nitpicky. I really didn't like the names of the powers uh, that, you know, that kind of, there are. There's two categories. There are supers and there's mages. And supers rely on physical prowess to fight, keeping their affairs up close and personal, while the mages are distance dangers. They're kind of glass cannons, in other words, or at least that's what they, they say. Now, from what I watched as I, you know, what I listened to, that's not the case at all because the, the, the mages go toe to toe with the supers pretty consistently. Um, you know, you would think that there's going to be a point where, um, the, the mages kind of dominate until the supers get on top of them. And once the supers get to them, it's all said and done with, but they can also stop the supers while they're far away. No, I mean, they go blow for blow, trade for trade, tit for tat a lot in the book. Um, there's also a third class, which doesn't get a lot of mention from everybody. It's called a super mage. In which, um, what happens is, as a person, in very rare events, this person will get both types of powers, both the super and the mage. Now, I, I really say, I hated the titles, um, because the super part made me think of superheroes. I'm thinking, like, you know, Superman, who's strong, and then there are mages. Um, the supers, you know, like I say, they have their, their muscles, but it really has nothing to do with that at all. Nothing. Just that they're more physical, and the mage part, bother me similarly because they don't study spells uh they just acquire them naturally uh the names should have reflected like the proximity to the powers you know or, or the proximity required to do things you know like ranged and you know up close and personal stuff i don't even know what i would word it as but it didn't didn't make so much sense to me as the supers and the mages and i think it was just chosen so you could get super mage as a title uh if you want my my honest opinion um but that's that's my opinion on what they should or shouldn't have done with the titles of the, the spells. That's just, just, it's just part of the story. I have to live with it. And I don't hold any of what I just said against the book at all. That's my issue. Now, the tale centers on Morgan, the MC who has no powers and is in the final year that he has for them to ever show up. He is friends with this pretty rich girl who just happens to be the leader of the city he lives in. Uh, her dad, Lord Simon, hates the boy with a passion and wants him dead. Now, here is one of the parts that I really don't understand how these two are connected. Morgan and the girl. Morgan is a street urchin who picks through trash for food all but like one night a week. Uh, the girl is super rich and would have con- no connections to him whatsoever in real life. They would have no intersection at all. And yet they've been friends for years. Even if they did intersect at some point, the father would have cut them off and she would never have been able to see him again. And believe me, the guy has the power to do it. Like if he said, I don't want this kid coming near my daughter ever again, the kid would never make his way near that section of the city, let alone go visit the girl every other couple of days. Okay, it just would not happen. Uh, so there's a need, a real need, for some backstory here. Just to kind of help you understand their connection. But that never comes. I like I don't understand how they know each other, why they like each other, what they do. Now, now <clears throat> Morgan suddenly gets his powers and immediately thereafter ends up killing two men who were sent to kill him. Uh, he flees, sees his gal pal, and they decide to flee the city together, heading to a university that can kind of teach them how to use their powers. Morgan quickly, quickly learns, learns, quickly learns that super mages are feared and quickly killed off. So he has to pretend to just be a super. Now, again, one more issue I have with Simon, I mean, not Simon, but Morgan and Lord Simon's daughter is that Morgan plays the innocent farm boy just a bit too well uh he misses and hints suggestions suggestions you know that his companion throws at him like she likes him like she like likes him 
even though she does everything but pass him a note saying, uh, I like you. Do you like me? Yes or no? I mean, that's just the way it, it comes across. He is completely clueless about sex and the many implications that go along with the act. Like I said, it just did not feel normal. And I believe if he had lived a very sheltered life the entirety of his life, then it would be believable. But the dude comes from the cold, hard streets of a major city. He didn't know about sex by the time he was able to talk, okay? Not Morgan. Completely and utterly clueless. And that bothered me. I just couldn't see it or believe it. Now, um, it could be, and I'm, I'm throwing this out there, and they don't make any kind of hints or suggestions, but either Morgan is completely asexual. In other words, he has no interest in women or men in any way, or he's totally gay. And again, that's not a bad thing per Seinfeld. Nothing wrong with that. But if he's gay, he, he shows no inclination to anybody else. The guy is just totally, totally clueless. And it just, it doesn't play right. There's just something off about it. Um, and I don't know, I don't know how to, to word it any better that Morgan just is, is kind of stupid in that aspect. You know, and I, it, it's just one of those things that bugs me. You know, because nobody is that dense. There's a point somewhere along the line where it would sink in or someone would step up and tell him, you know, wake up, kid. And he's got a mentor who who is just is tripping over himself to teach Morgan things that knows what's going on. And he never says a word. He never says a word. So I don't understand that whole concept. Now, one thing I want to say is I've read this book before, not this particular book, but I've read it in some capacity. Um, it's reminiscent of Reborn Apprentice. And you know I love that story. Um, and it's also very close to Dante's Immortality. Reborn and Supermage both feature OP characters who just want to know how to stomp on opponents bigger and better than them rank-wise. Um, I tried really hard not to compare apples to apples here, but there are beats that have a very similar rhythm in each of the books. Sometimes the OP characters bother me and sometimes they don't and i guess it just depends on the writing because as much as i hated reborn apprentice i enjoyed super mage um but i even loved dante's immortality more and dante did it first and he did it they did it better um not that this is a bad story but it really kind of has like similarities in a lot of different ways much in the same way as like um dodge tank follows pangeo online like Dodge Tank literally took the concepts from Pangea Online with the author's permission and did their own story, okay? Um, very similar, very similar. Now, I know here they didn't do that with Dante's Immortality, or if they did, I don't know anything about it, but um, the tales are very close to one another in the way things are done. And, and, and again, I'm not trying to beat this guy down or anything like that because the stories are different enough. They're both original enough. Um, but like I said, I, I know I've read this stuff prior to getting here. Um, otherwise, the story is a bit of a fun little romp, and it had some great moments. Um, and it had characters that you really hated and wanted to see beaten, maimed, or killed. And that's what you need. You need that. You know, like I said in the beginning with Dun uh, the, the Bunker Corps, uh, I needed a bad guy. I needed a villain to hate. I needed somebody to kick when they were down because they were just that rotten evil. I mean, we get those in this book. We get them handed to us on a silver platter because it just seems like everybody in this book, they, they're a dick in some way, okay? There's just there's just no other way to put it. Um, they're D-bags and, and, you know, they're all out against, they're all out against poor, poor Morgan, okay? Um, but that's just some of the stuff. Now, Doug Teasdale does narration, and I can't say that he didn't help this book move along. I mean... Uh, he does. I just did a segment with him on the City in the Dungeon, and I talked him up pretty well uh, while, while I was there. Um, so, yeah, I think you know I think he does a good job, uh, and I, I, I don't want to um, repeat things that I just did. I know I do that a lot, though, with Andrea Parsno and Jeff Hayes. <coughs> but Tisdale Jr. really brings it to the book. I mean, he, he, he helps keep it on, on task and doing well. Uh, and I have no issues with his narration whatsoever. I, I think he's a good addition to this genre. I think he, he really does. And it makes me want to read Scott of Artemis soon. Uh, I think that there, there is some real potential in that book if he narrated it as well. So I'm going to give that a shot. My final score here is a seven. It's a pretty solid first adventure. I just hope that book two drops, the MC's Naivete, 
and proffer some some real challenges. And I hope it kind of deviates from Dante's immortality. And since I don't think Dante's immortality is even close to coming out with book two yet, that this will kind of, the next book here will kind of be able to step away from that shadow. Uh, because I really felt like this had elements of Dante's in it. Um, but with there not being another book in Dante's, there's no way I can say, hey, I've read this before. This way I can say, hey, this book came out and it was totally, totally great and it was totally different and, and I enjoyed it. <clears throat> so what I guess is, is that that's all I have left to say. So thank you all very much for watching, everyone. I do appreciate you taking the time to watch or listen to the show. If you want to support us, you can like the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast Facebook page, the Lit RPG Podcast Facebook page, or the YouTube page, or just share and like the video. I sincerely hope that you've enjoyed our show. I know I went off a little bit today, and I apologize, but man, I was just... I was wound up. So please leave comments or suggestions in the section below. And feel free to tell me whatever you like. I enjoy the feedback. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. Uh, please remember to always, always leave a review for any book that you've read or listened to. Authors really depend on reviews. And just as an example, I'm going to throw Dave Wilmore's name out there. Um, he got his book, um, Shadow Sun Survival, to get 300 reviews. And it kicked him up into a next tier um, for Amazon. So he's going to be like really um, given more exposure uh, than he would have if he just had 100 reviews or 200 reviews. Uh, that really, really is amazing. And I thank you guys all who, who went out and did do reviews for him uh, because he deserves it. Excuse me. All authors deserve it. And I think that, you know, it's important to do those reviews authors depend on them. So please keep that in mind. I uh, also want to remind you that somewhere throughout the show, there's probably been one or two codes hidden by Ramon, and he'll have a way to tell you how to go and access those codes to get a free audiobook from Simon Vale, um, which he's an awesome guy. I appreciate everything he does for us, um, supporting us in the ways that he can. Uh, so I just want to say for the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast Ray, if, Podcast Ray, let me try that again, shall we? I'm going to wind back up. For the Little RPG Audiobook Podcast, I'm Ray. Keep listening.